Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman. We're we'll continuing with our series of videos on how to improve your game. Today, I want to hit right on the nail how to improve your game. I'm going to go over 10 things I think will help people in general improve their game. You're probably doing some of these already, but this will give you food for thought. This is going to be one of those videos that's a little bit more like a podcast. I put one of the end game positions from one of my suggestions on the board, but we're not going to be using the board too much today. So if today you want a video that has a lot of action on the board, probably you want to look at one of my other videos first. Okay, so we're going to do the top, maybe the top 10 things you can do to improve your game. This is going to be very subjective. Some people are going to come back and say, you put in these three things and I would have put in these other three things instead. And it's just a matter of their opinion. That's perfectly okay. I respect other coaches' opinions. I respect other players' opinions. Um, this is just going to be my opinions, and hopefully it'll be helpful for everybody. I'm going to do them in roughly reverse order of how important I think they are. Not exactly in order, but kind of in a vaguely reverse order. Okay, so let's get right to it. What's number 10? The 10th thing you can do to improve your game. And I, I call this avoiding barriers. Another way of putting this is keeping an open mind. I have an awful lot of students, I get to them, and they have very reasonable barriers that they put up. For instance, they might have young kids and they don't have a lot of time to study chess. Well, that's a very reasonable barrier, and I understand that. But other people put up like crazy barriers. They don't want, they don't want to play games online because people cheat with the computers. But then they don't want to play games over the board because when they play over the board, people not everybody is friendly. And when they play over the board, some people, they're, they're paired with in tournaments are too young and they don't like to play young people, you know. So we have people who don't like to play over the board. We have people who don't like to play on, online. They put up these barriers. You know, when I tell people, if you're playing someone, don't pay attention to how old they are. Pay attention to what kind of moves they make on a board. If they make good moves, then they're a good player. If they make bad moves, they're a bad player. It doesn't really matter what their age is. Yes, we know that people at different ages act differently. That's true. And you, you know, one of the things you get to do as you play in tournaments and clubs is you get to learn how to deal with these things. That's part of becoming a good player. You can't become a good player if you don't know how to deal with different types of situations. Usually you leave them to, to the tournament director, but you have to know how to do that. Uh, and what's another barrier? Well, another barrier is, oh, I don't want to read this book. It's in descriptive notation. This is exactly the opposite of the way I felt when I was starting. I started out with descriptive notation. And when they switched algebraic notation, I didn't view that as a barrier. I viewed that as an opportunity to learn more about chess and to read foreign books. And, you know, I thought learning algebraic was, was, was fun. And it only took me a few minutes. It's not like it takes me hours and hours. Today, we have the opposite problem. People know algebraic. And when they see an older book in descriptive, they say, oh, I can't read it. Well, it's not like learning a whole foreign language. It might take you all of five minutes how to learn the uh, descriptive notation. Uh, another barrier is people read Hans Kamak's book, Pawn, Power, and Chess, and they're worried about his terminology. Well, there's no test on his terminology. You don't have to remember it to understand the book. When I read the book, I didn't like the terminology either, but I just ignored it, and I learned all the stuff that the book had to teach me. So these are the kind of things I'm talking about. Uh, keep an open mind. Learn from your losses. Learn to talk to people and listen to what they're saying. Take feedback objectively. Feedback is very important in getting better, and that leads us to our next one. Number nine is... You can take chess lessons. Well, maybe I should have made that higher since I'm a chess coach. Why do you take chess lessons? Well, you take chess lessons because if you lock yourself in a closet and just play chess and study chess, you're not getting any feedback. It would be like going to school and the teacher wouldn't answer any questions. They wouldn't bring you up to the board and look at your homework. They wouldn't return your tests. If you didn't get feedback in school, school would lose a very high percentage of what they're trying to do for you. And the same thing is true in chess. You want to get feedback. Now, if you're getting regular feedback from your club and your tournaments and you, you know a lot of strong players and you can talk to them and you don't need, a le need lessons from a strong player, that's understandable. But you want to get that feedback one way or another. Now, you can get feedback on which tactical mistakes you made by just using an engine. But there's a lot more to feedback from people learning things than just looking at an engine and seeing, you know, what tactics that you missed during the game. You want to know why you're playing too fast, why you're playing too slow, if you're playing too fast or too slow, what are your misconceptions? You know, do you really think that doubled pawns 
are, are that much of a big deal and you go out of your way to avoid them when, in fact, they're pretty much a little deal, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, when you're taking chess lessons, they teach you what are the proper things you should be reading, maybe suggestions on videos, what are the proper people to play, where to play, who to play. Uh, they review games with you, do puzzles, do exercises, answer questions, discuss issues, and so on. Okay, number eight. What's number eight on things you can do to improve? And that is to play speed games. Now, a lot of people go, Dan, you're against speed games. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I've never said I was against speed games. I, I do think if you play exclusively speed games, like let's say you never play games f slower than 15 minutes and you wonder why you're not a really good chess player. Well, you're probably not learning how to think correctly. And for that, you really need slow games. But that doesn't mean that speed games shouldn't be played at all. I do suggest that people play speed games with the same increment as important slow games, assuming that their important slow games have a smaller increment. So let's say you're going to play at the World Open next month, and they're going to play 40 moves in 110 minutes, followed by sudden death in 30 with a 10-second increment. It might be, be helpful to play a bunch of speed games with a 10-second increment. For instance, you could play a 110 game, a 1-minute game with 10-second increment, or a 2-minute game with a 10-second increment. Uh, that would be probably good practice for what would happen if you get into time trouble at the World Open. If, you can't, if you're playing in a tournament with a big increment, of course, you can't play speed games. There's no such thing as a speed game with a 30 or a 45 second increment. Okay, so you want to play speed games. What are they good for? Well, they're very good for looking up your openings after the game. When you play speed chess, you want to look up your openings, and we'll talk about looking up your openings in a minute, but you want to look up your openings and... Figure out what you're going to do next time. And whether you're playing a slow game or a speed game, wherever you're looking up the opening, whether it be a database, an engine, or whatever, it doesn't care whether you just played a slow game or a speed game. The moves are the moves in the opening. So and so speed games are a wonderful place to learn your openings. Speed games are also a great place to work on your quick tactical vision. You want to be very quick at recognizing tactics that are very easy. And speed games has a lot of them, both for you and for your opponent. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, too, when we talk about how to learn those things. Another thing speed games are good for is time management. Speed games have a lot more time management than slow games because you're using time management throughout the whole game. So you want to get used to kind of looking at the clock. A lot of my students think, oh, I'll just play a speed game and play slow, and if I lose on time, I lose on time. That's not the right way to do it. You want to play speed games and try to not lose on time at all unless you're absolutely dead lost and it really doesn't matter whether you're resigning or your clock's falling. But you want to manage your time well, and this is a great way to practice it. Okay, number seven is learning your tabiyas, your standard opening sequences. You can do that by looking in a book. I used to use MCO 10. Now there's MCO 15. There's lots of uh, repertoire books these days. We have videos. We have databases to, to learn these tabiyas. The tabiyas are the standard opening sequences for the moves that you play. If you're a E4 player and people play E5 and you play the Roy Lopez, maybe you want to learn the tabia of the closed Roy Lopez. And after you learn that, maybe learn the tabia of the Berlin defense or maybe the tabia of the open Roy Lopez. So these are tabias, standard opening moves. It's sort of like learning a tree where you're learning the trunk of the tree before you're learning all the branches. Then what you want to do is after each game, slow or fast, and if, if it's fast, you might want to wait for a bunch of games, but you want to look up your openings after the game and ask yourself the key question. If we play this game again and I played my moves that I know and my opponent played the exact same moves that he did, on which move would I improve? At what point could I have made a better move? And again, you can use a video. You can use an engine. You can use a book. You can use a database. If I had to play this game again and we play the same moves, at some point there's a move you could play that would have been better. Which one is it, and how are you going to remember it for next time? Okay, ne next is number six. We, you want to learn end games, and one of the best ways to learn end games is to go over entire games. A lot of entire games include good end games. But there's also books that are just on end games. There's end game encyclopedias. There's end game puzzles. So you want to do puzzles of all different types. That includes end game puzzles, board vision puzzles, and positional puzzles. We'll talk about tactical puzzles a little bit in another uh, one of our, our notes here. But we, you want to do puzzles. You want to do end game puzzles, board vision puzzles, like in Jeff Coakley's Winning Chess Puzzles for Kids books, 
positional puzzles, like in uh, how to reassess your chess workbook, that kind of thing. Okay, I have a puzzle here. We're going to break up our list now that we're about halfway through by looking at this puzzle. This is white to play. White to play and do the best he can. I'm not going to say whether he should try to win, he should try to draw. Well, the first thing you look at is both sides have one pawn, and it's white's move, and he can get toward the pawns first. So you, the first thing you would guess is that white's the one who's going to try to be trying to play for a win. But the question is, how would you do that? If you immediately go after the pawn with king to e5, black plays king c4, and both sides are in Tsukzvang now. It's mutual Tsukzvang. This is called trebuchet. Trebuchet doesn't mean mutual Tsukzvang. Trebuchet means it's this pattern where the, the two kings are up against the two pawns like this because it looks like an ancient trebuchet. And whoever moves here is losing, so therefore white should not do this. But if white waits with king to f5, then black will play king to c3, hitting the pawn. And if white tries to guard the pawn, black says, good, I'll get into trebuchet, and I will win. So it turns out king f5 loses, king e5 loses, but king e3 will clearly lose the pawn. What should white do? It turns out this is an example of what I call a dance-around problem. What you really need to do is dance around the d2 square until black takes the pawn and then go on the d2 square and get the opposition. We talked about this in my video earlier on king and pawn against king. So what you can do is play king e3, king c3, king e2. And now if black is clever and doesn't take the pawn and plays king c4, you must not play king d2 because king d4 will get the opposition and win. What you do is you dance around the d2 square. You go to any square that touches it, for instance, e1. And you say to black, let me know when you're going to take that pawn. Because when you're going to take that pawn, right after you do, I'm going to jump on that d2 square. And black says, uh, I won't take it right away. And white says, all right, let me know when you will. And black says, how about now? You want to jump on d2? And white says, no, thank you. And black says, all right, finally, I'll take the pawn. White says, I'll get the opposition. Black tries to get white to go the wrong way. He can't. Finally, black has to push the pawn. White does not let the black hang in front of the pawn, or else it would be tic-tac-toe win. If black goes back, white can just come up. Here, white doesn't have to go straight back. He can go either side. It doesn't matter. We talked about this in king and pawn against king. Once the pawn gets to the sixth rank, then you have to go straight back. Now you have to not let the king in front. And if he finally pushes the pawn, he can either give you the pawn or stalemate, draw. So that's the best white can do. So when you do these end games, you learn end games. A lot of ways of learning end games is either go over the end games through your games or through master games or amateur annotated games or through puzzles. Or you could read a chess and opening uh, end game encyclopedia. You could read a a nice book like Silman's Endgame Course, where it does it by rating category and what you need to know. Okay, so that's number six. Number five is go over annotated games. One of the most important things I tell people about going over annotated games, I generally recommend books, but if you want to watch annotated videos because you don't read, you, you learn better through your ears than your eyes, I understand. I'm not sure which are the best videos. Uh, some videos are at your level and some videos are going to be above or below your level. you got to pick out videos that are right at your level because very often people watch videos above their level and they perfectly understand what the guy is saying, but then when they go off and play, they think about things that are n not appropriate for what they should be thinking about at their level. They think about subtle strategic things and then they go making gross tactical blunders because they just watched a video that was way above their head. If you're starting with books, I would say... Very important to struct, start with instructive anthologies. For instance, Irving Chernev wrote a book a long time ago called The Most Instructive Games of Chess Ever Played. It's going to be a lot more helpful to go through the games in that book than reading Bobby Fischer's My 60 Memorable Games. Why? Well, it's not because Chernev's book is a lot better than Fischer's book. Fischer's book is a classic. It's a wonderful book. The problem is Fischer's not writing that book to help you play chess better unless you're a very, very strong player to begin with. If you're a 1300 player trying to become a 15 or 1600 player, my 60 memorable games is not going to help you one tenth as much as the most instructive games of chess ever played because Chernev is trying to help you learn how to play chess better with every game. Every game has a theme, 
Bobby's just trying to tell you how he played those games, why they were memorable, why he won in some cases, why he drew. And he's just trying to tell you why the game was the game the way it was. But he's he if he's trying to help you get to be better, it's a side effect of the game, which that side effect works well on good players that are already pretty good. Not so well on lower rated players that are trying to learn something. So I highly suggest starting with instructive anthologies. If you don't know what they are, you can go to my website, danheisman.com. Go on the right under more and go to uh, recommended book lists. And I have a set of instruct, uh, a set, a list of instructive anthology books. You want to go over master and amateur annotated games. Master games because they tell you what to do and amateur games because the author is trying to tell you here's the typical things people at your level do. Here's how you can avoid them and here's how you can take advantage of them if your opponent plays them. So for instance, there's some there's chess master versus chess amateur, but obviously half the people playing those games are the masters. I have a book which I think is a very, very good book. It's called The World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book. I think you can learn an awful lot from that book. For instance, if you're learning endgames and you go to my endgame chapter, you're going to read a lot of practical things about endgames. I guarantee you, if you're not a good endgame player and you carefully study my chapter on endgames in the amateur game book, you're going to learn a lot because there's going to be a lot of practical endgame issues that come up in these amateur games. And that's what I'm doing. I'm using those amateur games as a teaching point. Also, I tell people, you don't have to go over the games extremely slowly. If you want to guess each move and give each move to an engine and play over the game in a couple hours, that's fine. But if you do that on every move of every game that you ever play over in a book, it's going to take you forever to go over a lot of games. In my first three years of playing tournament chess, I went over about 2,000 annotated master games. That sounds like a lot, but it's only two a day. But I did 2,000 and my rating went from unrated to about 2,000 in three years. And I did the games fairly quickly. I, th I would say I took no more than 20 minutes on each game, roughly, on average. Today, I, I time myself. I do about eight minutes a game. But that's because my board vision is better and I'm learning less. People say to me, don't you learn a lot less when you go over the games as quickly as that? And I say, no, of course not. I learn less per unit game, but I learn just as much, if not more, per unit time. My last comment on going over annotated games is if the author is telling you something, if he has a sideline where he's giving you two pages of analysis on how Alyekin could have won that endgame even if his opponent had not blundered, if you want to skip that and go to the next game because you don't find it interesting, that's probably a good idea. Only read the parts that you find interesting. Again, you're trying to learn the most you can per unit time, not per unit game. If you go over more games and spend less time per game, you're still spending that same amount of time learning. As long as you're learning the most you can per unit time, that's the key. All right, number four, do repetitive study of easy tactics. This is something I get into arguments with over intermediate players who think that easy tactics are too easy for them. Well, they're right. It's too easy for them to solve, but you're not trying to solve it. You're trying to recognize it. You're, the idea of doing easy patterns is so that if you have a, a candidate move in mind, and you think about what that candidate move would do, you can immediately see, oh, I can't make that candidate move because my opponent can do this, this, and this to me after I make that move, and he'll win a pawn. If you can do that really quickly and accurately, you can pretty much discard all those easy tactic candidate moves that give your opponent those easy tactics, and you can play a lot better. When I play speed chess against intermediate players, they, they make these mistakes all the time, yet they tell me these two books are too easy for them. I tell them it's a lot like learning 6 times 7. 6 times 7 is really easy. You want to hear me do it? 7 and 7 is 14. 7 is 21. 7 is 28. 7 is 35. 7 is 42. See, I did it quickly and accurately. Is that what I'm trying to do? No, I'm trying to memorize it. I should, I should just memorize 6 times 7 is 42. It's my multiplication tables from second grade. You see, that's the difference. If Just because you can solve something really easily doesn't mean you can recognize it and recognize the whether it's, it's occurring in your game and what, what the solution is, quickly and accurately. That's why repetitious study of easy tactics is really helpful. You can use a book like John Bain's Chess Tactics for Students to start. I have a list on my website again. Or you can use a server where you put restrictive limits on the difficulty of the problems. You can say, don't give me problems you know, less than 950 or greater than 1300. And if you want to do harder problems too, set up a second account 
where you make it unrestricted and that that way when you get a problem right that's rated 1300 it'll give you a 1400 problem when you get a 1400 right it'll give you 1500 that'll be a second account where it's where it's unrestricted okay that's number four number three when you're playing your slow games which we'll talk about in number two review them with your opponent which is one reason why over the board is better because you're much more likely to get your opponent to go over the game with you over the board than you will online unless you're playing a friendly like Team 45-45 game. Go over the game with your opponent. He's, he's the only one who can answer questions like, why did you make that move? Go over the games with as, ma the, the game with as many strong players as you can find. Go over with the coaches, strong players, club mates. And finally, you can go over your game with an engine. Now, an engine can't answer your questions, but an engine is going to be the very best thing in the world for finding tactics that both sides miss. There's no substitute. No human can possibly find the kind of tactics that Stockfish 10 can find. Now, if it's a really difficult tactic that you missed, then probably even if a master can't find it when he's going over the game with you, it's probably not worth even talking about because you wouldn't be able to find it anyway, so that's not as important. But going over your games with engines is definitely a good idea, but they're not your first line of defense. Okay, what's number two? The second most important thing you can do to improve your game is play slow games. And when I say play slow games, I mean long time control games. A lot of people play long time control games, and then they play the whole game in seven minutes. <clears throat> and they say to me, Dan, I played a slow game. And I say, no, you didn't. You played a slow time control but you play the game fast. So you want to play as slow games, preferably over the board in tournaments and clubs. There's no player yet who's become a top player who didn't spend a lot of their youth playing many, many, many tournaments and many club games. That's how people get good. You know, you, you play and lose, you know, thousands of games. You want to practice good time management. You'd want to take almost all your time each game, no matter what the time limit is, and you want to practice different time limits so you're, you get good at time management. You want to spend more time on your critical moves and much less time on your non-critical moves. I call that micro time management. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, I have an earlier video on time management. But you want to play as many slow games as you can. And again, don't put up barriers. I understand there's certain adults that are very busy. They can't play a lot of slow games. That's a legitimate barrier. But if you don't want to play in tournaments because you're afraid you'll be paired with a young kid or you're afraid you'll lose or you don't want to play because you're going to lose 17 rating points. People who are more worried about their rating than getting better are almost always people who have trouble getting to be good players. Don't worry about your rating when you're playing in these tournaments. Worry about learning something. If you learn something every game, if you do the things we've been talking about today in this video, you get to be a better player, your rating will follow your playing strength. If you have a bad tournament and you lose 100 points, that means you're probably underrated you'll gain them right back. If you have a great tournament and you play over your head and gain 100 points, there's no sense trying to preserve it. The only way you're going to get that 100 rating points for real is to get to be a better player. If you play on the next tournament, you lose the 100 points back because you're not that much of a better player yet. Don't be upset. It's still The rating is just reflecting how good you are. Get to be a better player. Your rating will go up. Okay, finally, the number one thing I think people can do and I've talked about this with some of the other ones, but now we're going to talk about it in a little more depth, is analyze with strong players. It doesn't have to be your own game. It doesn't have to be any game at all. It could be a puzzle. could be an exercise. Go to a club. Make friends with the strong players. Find out who likes to talk about positions in games. And sit down and analyze with them. Analyze everything you can. If you can get them to analyze your games, so much the better. But analyze. Sit down and ask them, you know, questions. Ask, why are you looking at those candidate moves? Why not this other candidate move? How come after you made this move you didn't consider this? What, why are you looking at that line? What, what, what's your logic here? What, what's going on? Try to pick their brain. You know, some people are not going to want you to do that. Okay, find out what they can tolerate and learn as much as you can. Uh, but a lot of good players will help you. When I first joined the Germantown Chess Club, they said, Dan, you're not a very good player, but we think you're going to be some. Please resign your games when you're dead lost. If you do that, we'll be glad to go over them with you. Don't waste our time. And they did. They sat down. They went over games with me. They went over my games. They went over their games. They let me sit in when they were going over their games. I listened to two good players analyzing their game. It was fascinating what they were looking at and what they weren't looking at. I learned a tremendous amount just sitting there listening 
to two good players analyzing the game. Later, as I got a little better, then they let me per- partake more in the analysis. And that was great. So I learned a tremendous amount. This is the number one thing you want to do. Now, it's true that if you're 1,100 and you can't find you know, a player over 2,000, you might say, well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll analyze the game with a 1,400 player. Well, that's better than nothing, for sure. But you're not going to learn as much going over a game with a 1,400 player as you would going over a game with someone rated over 2,000. So if at all possible, try to find someone over 2,000. I know you have a friend who's 1972 and he's insulted. You go over games with him. That's okay. You know what I mean. But in general, you don't want just someone who's a little better than you or even a couple hundred points better than you if you're really low. You want someone who really knows what they're doing who can teach you how to analyze positions. Okay, so as best you can, as much as you can, go to clubs, tournaments, take lessons, whatever it is that gets the ear of these strong players. People who, there's a lot of strong players who don't want to talk to you, but there's a lot of strong players that are perfectly happy to talk to you. So you want to be able to analyze with them. Go over puzzles, games, exercises, whatever it takes. I think this is the number one thing you need to get better is to analyze with strong players. Spend as much time as you can doing that. It's amazing how much you can pick up by listening to them analyze. That's also a reason why I do my Think Out Loud things here on the uh, YouTube. I play games Thinking Out Loud uh, against the computer. I have my 20-minute exercise where I think out loud. You get a chance to hear me. Now, that's not as good as sitting down with me in a lesson and picking my brain and saying, Dan, why didn't you look at this? Dan, why didn't you look at that? How come you looked at this? Why didn't you look deeper here? How come you didn't look as deep there? that kind of thing. It's really quite helpful. All right, so today was a a little bit more of a podcast. It's uh, my 10 things that you can do to make yourself a better player. Hopefully, most of these things you already knew. Some of them you may not have. Even if I threw in two or three things that really rang a bell with you, hopefully that makes the whole video worthwhile. For my YouTube series, this is Dan Heisman. We'll see you next time. Bye.